Okay, yeah, so we have, we have a good amount to go. So I would say um, we can go ahead and, and, I think I said this before, but we can go ahead and, and just uh, ignore these guys down here. We can just sort of make them like gray or something. So, um, okay, cool. So it looks like we're, we're, we're making our way through here. So that's cool. Um, as you guys have been doing it, uh, I'm, ex I'm expecting that uh, uh, you're finding fewer and fewer new things. Is that right? Or am I wrong? Yeah, yeah okay. Well, which is to be expected. Like the first pass, we probably get most of it. Um, so, okay, cool. So it'd be good to keep cranking through here. The other one I just wanted to show you guys is, um, now, I don't know how, you, you guys are mostly interacting with Zotero on the, through the desktop app or through uh, the brow your browser? The desktop app? How, is everybody doing desktop? Are you guys doing browser desktop? Yeah, I think the desktop, it gives you a little more control about this kind of stuff. Um, so I'll just show you real quick. Um, so I've gone through and I've, as of this morning, last night slash this morning, I've cleaned this all up, so this is good. So it's just a general um, reminder to you, not reminder, but just uh, best practices. So, you know, so we're working on our project this summer, right, which is cool. But also, you know, I love the fact you guys are, are helping us with this and you guys are partnering on this and you guys are collaborating on this, this is great. But sort of separate from that, I really want you guys to be developing all your other skills, right? So separate from this project, I want you guys b building those muscles up to be you know, a researcher, how to do this stuff. And so, so yeah, we're, we're doing it around our particular question this summer, but most of these things are totally portable to your job search, to your other career interests, to all that kind of stuff. So, so um, you know, as we do this, as we do these various things, obviously get the task done, but as much as possible, I mean, want to encourage you guys to try, you know, explore it a little bit deeper than we, maybe we need to do or, or, or that we have to do for our boundaries so that you can figure out how this tool really works or how I, how I can use it myself kind of deal. And so in that spirit, I'll just say um, uh, uh, there's a couple different things you can do with this and that we will be doing. And so I want to be very transparent with all, this, all the steps I'm doing just so that you guys know if you wanted to repeat this yourselves, you could do that. So again, our main question here is, well, we already know there are plastics everywhere, so it's not are there, but it's how much plastic is in the ocean, particularly the deep ocean, but how much plastic is there, A, and then B, um, what form is it in? Is it, is it is it fiber? Is it polypropylene? Whatever. We haven't talked too much about that, so that's what I want to talk about today to sort of finish our introduction to plastics, uh, or at least in our terms of our methodolo methodological approaches. Um, but uh, uh, as, we, as we do this, these are all of our possible things to look for, right? Last time, I went into the um, uh, NOAA's microplastic database, right? We couldn't figure out how to get the data out of the European one, but we got the data out of, of ours. I sucked that stuff out, and I've now entered those references in here as well. So those 37, I think there's some like 37 references uh, or, or sources of, of information in that um, NOAA database. And so those references have all been entered in here. And now as we're, as we're starting to go down this road, um, so the first step was like, let's start to find stuff. And we found stuff, and we're still finding stuff, but the, the rate of new stuff is gonna start to trickle down, right? It's gonna start to get smaller and smaller. So now we kind of know the big shape. We know, we know what the, you know, if we're blind, we could sort of put our hands around it now, and we can kind of tell it's an elephant kind of thing. We don't know, we don't know what the health of the elephant is or what's inside the elephant, but we kind of know the basic shape of our database right now. So right now, uh, as of this morning, we have 266 references in there, um, most of which are primary literature. Some are some databases. There are a few databases, and there's, there's a, a PhD dissertation and stuff, but most, is, is, most are journal articles, um, the things that are in here. Um, and, uh, and so as we get to this stage, we've, ca we've, we've you know, last you know, week or two, we've cast a big net, we've grabbed a bunch of crap, and we've stuck it in there, and we're jamming it in there. Um, what I did last night was clean up this. 
Um, with a group like ours, a diverse group, we totally need to do this frequently, right? But even when you're doing your own research by yourself, you need to do this at every so often, right? And that's because um, the stuff that goes into here, the data, the metadata, isn't always totally consistent. So I spent about four hours yesterday fixing all these things. And that's not that you guys did anything wrong or that I did anything wrong, it's that certain databases aren't as complete as others. Some of them, for example, um, here. Um, no, is that not gonna work? No, it's not gonna work. It's gonna be, um, uh, so let me show you. I'm gonna go here, maybe do it like this. Um, this one. Uh, sorry. Okay, so this, I'll talk about how we do this in a second, but this is the database as of the other day when it, when it was still a little messy. Um, and essentially I, I, I had the, um, the, the, our database spit out from the Zotero and turn into a comma separated value file. So a, a spreadsheet, a tabular spreadsheet file. And so as we start to look through here, even though if the font is a little small, don't worry about that, but have a look. Here's publication year, right? So remember the thing we always need is author, year, source of the thing, right? There's other things we want like title, et cetera, but we need to be able to go back to the source, right? And so we need the, the author slash authors names. We need, we need the year was published and then the source thing, right? And then we can pretty much get everything else, at least if we have those things. If there's something missing we, with, with those sort of three key pieces of information, we can usually track down the, the thing we're hunting. <clears throat> but as I start to look through here, if I make this one bigger, I can't do this. Terrible, but okay, so as I look through here, so this, this, this entry was 2020, 2023, 2024, uh, but then this one is nothing, right? So this one's blank, 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 blank. So there's some error there. And then other, and then this one is the title, or sorry, this, this one is the publication, so the source of the info, right? And here's all these titles, 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 titles. And then all of a sudden, um, some of these things are, are all marine pollution bulletin, right? Like super loud. And so obviously that's marine pollution bulletin or whatever, but it's, if we go to now throw this in a paper, like let's say for our capstone or our ultimate paper we're writing or whatever it is, it's gonna look like that, right? It's not gonna be somehow magically fixed to be the, the correct way that the letters go. And that's just because some databases have these titles entered as, as all caps versus others don't. So for all that stuff, we gotta go, just go through and clean it up, which is not a problem, but we need to do it. The other one is we need to check the authors and so um, there's, there's some issues with authors also, similarly. And so, so whereas, whereas this one here correctly looks like it's saying uh, this person's last name, comma first, so that's cool. Um, uh, uh, one of the biggest challenges with these databases is how do we get people's names correctly? That's because some journals have, so if I publish a, a paper, sometimes it would be uh, Sean Anderson in the journal. Sometimes it would be Sean S. Anderson in the journal. Some journals only have S. Anderson, right? So, so, so there's, there's some variation in the formatting of different journals, right? And so way back when, when we made this decision, this was before com really computers were big and all this kind of stuff, some people decided it was simpler to just have an initial, let's say, rather than the person's first name, right? Um, now, 
what, what should be happening now is everybody should enter their full name. If the journal wants to format it for their publication as just my initial, you know, my, my initial letter in, in my name, that's cool. But there should be a database. But what's happened is because in 1970 this journal decided it's just going to be SS Anderson or something, that that's how it's now entered. And so all these things cause issues. And so a classic one now is especially um, uh, there's a lot of our colleagues are doing great work in Mexico and Spain and Italy um, on, on microplastics all, all around the world, but those places in particular. Um, and then a lot coming out of Asia and Southeast Asia, which is awesome, right? So we're getting better sense of what's going on around the globe. But it also means that the tradition in many of those countries, people have maybe four names, right? So it's like a first name, <clears throat> or maybe two first names, or, or it's their first name, but you know, it's like, it's like a word and then a word, and sometimes it's a word and a word, sometimes it's a word dash or hyphen and a word, and it just gets very complex. And so that's just another thing to come check. So for example, this guy, um, th this, I'm assuming this is correct, this is Michael's last name, Hammer Sky, <clears throat> right? But then, um, and then as we look up here, so this author, um, uh, last name, comma, first, and then a semicolon separating, that's how this database, that's how Zotero separates it, right? A semicolon is separating individuals from other, other individuals. Okay, um, but then this one, so the, here we have, so last name, comma, first, last name, comma, first, last name, but then this one, uh, this author, I just happen to know, uh, Zhang is their last name. So this one is kind of doesn't follow the format, right? And so that's probably because the journal we sucked it from uses a different formatting for names or whatever. So it just means that for all these things, once we start, it doesn't make sense to do it on a, on a one by one basis, but once we've now grabbed the shape of the elephant and we're feeling the elephant, we can tell it's an elephant, now let's go back and start to clean this stuff up. Again, periodically we need to go back in and clean it up. But, um, but I just wanted to show you guys that. And so there's various ways to do it. But um, one thing you can do is uh, on the, so this is my, now I'm back to my Zotero desktop window. As we look at this guy, um, uh, I can right click in here and I can pick all the different fields. So by default it has the, I think by default it has, um, I think it looks like this for you guys as default. Um, I think it looks like that. That's probably what your, your default view looks like, right? So all you need to do in that case is go into the middle window here. So here's our file structure. This is the actual, uh, if we're visualizing a document or the, or the data. And so all I would need to do is come up here, uh, right click on this dude, and then I can select what things I want to or don't want to. And so one of the ways I checked that was I said, oh, uh, tell me the year it's published. Okay, cool. And then remember, like all things, this is just a database, which is great. So I can click on here and I can sort by that, right? So when I sort by that, it's, it picks up the things, again, I've cleaned this all up now, so everything is fixed. But, but if there's holes or missing years or funky whatever, I can check that out. Similarly, I can come up here and I could, I could list it by authors and go through and make sure everything is cool, right? And make sure everything's consistent. And so that when we have author, we have this Carpenter author, who is it, Edward J. And, and this one, Carpenter Edward J. So that's the same Carpenter, right? It looks the same in the database, right? So if we were to do stuff, it, it makes sense. And so anyway, that sort of iterative go back and check is really fundamental to all the kind of work uh, we do, regardless, microplastics, not microplastics. Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody makes errors, either because of some system getting sucked in from a database or because you and I are doing something and it's tired and we're tired and we messed up or we're talking and we typed in the wrong letter, right? So the idea here is not to be angry or like, why did you enter this damn data that way? It's just like, let's just make sure it's correct. So we're constantly checking ourselves. We're constantly double checking, triple checking, all that kind of stuff. Okay, cool. So now the data set is starting to look pretty, pretty good. Um, 
I'm sure there's still problems in here that need to be cleaned up, but, but the major things are here. So everything should have a year. Every author, at least as of this morning, every author should be correctly for, uh, you know, formatted or it should be listed correctly. And why does that matter? Well, that matters because um, you know, if we want to go find it and what's this guy? And so if it was listed as Susanna as the last name instead of Butcher, that's going to send us down a weird rabbit hole, right? And the stuff we're going to start to transition to now, we want to make sure if there's a problem, we can go back to the original source. So, so we're trying to get this all cleaned up now so it saves us a bit of head, potential headache uh, uh, in the future. Okay. So the other thing you can do is now that I have my database or whatever, you can come up here and you can right click on this and you can say, uh, let's see what I say. Oh, sorry, not, not export item. So I want to do the whole thing. So I, I, I selected that top thing, hold the shift key down. And so now all of, all of our references in the library are selected. And then I can right click on here and I can say export items. And then it's going to tell me I can do various things. I can pick these different file formats. I can, you know, so in other words, I can submit it to another uh, bibliographic database tool, which is great. So this would be a, f a single file that would have all of my stuff in it, right? It all be zipped together. Then I could send it over to that other database and it could suck it in, right? So again, the, uh, I'd say the, there used to be many different options. The options have sort of dwindled over the last couple years. Zotero, as we mentioned, is free, which is why most of you guys uh, use it. Um, the reason why I started using it more is because all of these on like Research Rabbit and all these tools that we're playing with or potentially playing with, um, it, it dovetails well with those. Whereas my main database, that I, my main bibliographic database that I've used over the years since I was your guys' age, um, doesn't necessarily work too well with these things. So it's, it's, I think it's a, it's a more comprehensive database, but you also have to pay for it. So it's, you know, it costs. It's called EndNote. Um, so I can export this into my EndNote database if I wanted to, you know, that kind of thing. Um, uh, but we can also just pick CSV, then it can go through here, and then we can export this thing. Um, and so that would turn our, our inside the tool database into something we can manipulate outside uh, of our own database in, in whatever form we want. And so I've done that. And, and so, um, so we're getting ready to merge that into here. And so this is the database from, um, that I exported from Noah's microplastics uh, database. Make sense? Yeah, it, my, my, Everybody following me? Am I going too rambling? Okay. So, so, um, the ne so this database is, so all the regular columns are the stuff that Noah has in it, the, the information that Noah has in it. So um, it has, right, it has latitude and longitude, it has the date, it has the, some unique identifiers. Has you know, um, it has uh, some keywords here. It has the organ. It has the full reference, right? So this should be theoretically the full reference that we could then grab and, and throw in a search engine and find the reference or whatever. Um, there should be a, uh, there's a reference to the um, uh, unique identifier um, for the paper, which is another you know numeric way to find that unique reference, etc. It's got a shortened version, just how we talk to it, talk about it normally. Um, and then it has the data about, um, sorry, it's gonna be hard for you guys to see. And then it has uh, where, what ocean was the data collected in? And then if there's more specific data, like Gulf of California, like, you know, all that kind of stuff, how they sampled the, the the microplastics with a net or with a you know core or something, and then uh, importantly, um, what the concentration of microplastics were in that particular um, sample. Uh, and then because this is various things, some of it's water column, some of it is in sediment. There's some potential 
possible uh, options for the units. So some of it might be the amount per volume. Some of it might be the amount per dry weight of the soil or the sediment. So there's various things. And then, uh, and they give us some stuff, other stuff here. Okay. So um, what I've started doing, what we're going to do is we're going to start to add our own columns to this, right? So, we're, so, so the folks that created this said one day it would be nice to maybe look at um, polymer composition and all this and that, but you know, we're not quite there yet. And so they're simply saying the, the quantity of, of microplastics items that were, that were detected. We're trying to go beyond that, right? We're trying to see if we can fill in some of that stuff. Um, and so, so for clarity, as I mentioned, there's, there's only 37 references in that NOAA database, or at least only 37 references that relate to the stuff we're interested in. But there's, I don't know, thousands of lines of data in here. How's that work? Well, that is because these guys are all from the same study, right? So this was one sample or one area they measured. And this is an, all from the same study, all from the same uh, Afaro Nunez study, right? So they did a bunch of sampling, they did a bunch of sites. And so, so there was a total of 40 different estimates uh, or, or, or counts of microplastics um, in this Nunez study, right? Alfaro Nunez study, right? Whereas um, uh, this, the Alvarez uh, Zeferino, um, is a different reference, and they have they have uh, 331 measurements, right? Some of the references, so most of the references in here come from like two or three, or sorry, most of the data in here comes from two or three that have thousands of entries, right? So they were doing cruises across the ocean basin and doing net tows every few kilometers or something like that, right? So, so that's the structure of the database. That makes sense? So essentially we're, what we're gearing up to do next is to come up here and go over to the right and start to add in other things, right? So was this deep sea? Was this midwater? Was this the surface of the, the surface of the ocean? You know, those kinds of things. And so what that's gonna mean is we're gonna need to go back to that, to that paper and start to, and start to look at it, right? And so to go through and pull out additional information. And so it's, so we're not, I'm almost ready to share this with you guys, but that's why I wanted to have this discussion. So the other, so these are the options that they have had so far. So, so these are their existing categories, right? So Atlantic, Baffin Bay, Atlantic Ocean, Davis Strait, Arctic Ocean, or excuse me, Arctic Ocean, uh, Bay of Fundy and the Atlantic, all that kind of stuff, right? So this is, this I'd say is, is fairly poorly done. Right? And I'm not trying to attack anybody, I'm just, but I'm just saying, like, it's, it's, in other words, some papers probably gave a lot of detail of information, and so they could easily translate it. Other stuff, they might not have said it specifically in the paper. And I suspect, since it's a NOAA thing, and there's probably gazillions of people working on this, that they were explicit. And they were like, hey, we're only going to say what the authors say, right? And so... Uh, but but you know I would I would just note all of these things have a Latin lawn, so every single sample in here because right it's it's in a map every single sample in here has a, a measurement point. Now maybe they just have one measurement point for the three different areas they grabbed, but still there's there's some there's some point in space. So you know if worse comes to worse you should be able to go grab this Latin lawn and figure out what, uh, what region it's in, right? But that's an extra step. So that's something we can do that is not in the database, right? And so, so the idea here is um, let's see what additional info we can get out of here. Um, and so here are, here are uh, some of the other categories that um, we want to add. And so what I think, so how we're, how we're going to do this is we're going to take a stab for a week, you know, a couple days, and just try this. Almost assuredly, this first iterate, our first iteration of this database isn't going to work right. We're probably going to have to like, oh, no, 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 we should make like, we'll have to go back and redo these initial entries, which is fine. So we're, we're doing a, a, a pilot experiment here, right? But 
Um, one of the things that we want to talk about is the composition. So, so the key thing we're interested in is how much plastic is out there, but then also what form of plastic uh, is there. And so, so these are the, now there's, there's many other things, there's many other things, but these are, the, these are the main ones. These are the main categories that we see. Um, they all have longer words, and in fact, we can get even the more fancier uh, full chemical names, which we're not going to do. Um, and then we have some abbreviation. Um, and so, <clears throat> so when we go to do our search, and, so, and so I'd say this is, this is not a, a specific chemical per se. This is rather the family or the class of chemicals, right? So there's, there's little, there's variation in all this. There's, there's, there's trademarked ways to make polyethylene and, and additives and all this kind of stuff. So we put stuff ultimately in the FTIR, um, we'll get a very specific chemical output um, that, that might be much more detailed than this. But we'll, but, and so we, we want to capture that. So we're not going to ignore that. We're not going to delete that. But, but everything will get put into um, one of these categories, uh, probably or cellulose, which is sort of the, the default default uh, sort of uh, uh, organic non-polymer um, biological structure thing, right? Or calcium carbonate. Um, so basically, uh, what we want to do is go through these papers and say, hey, so right now they've said, right, let's review. So right now they've said that this, that sample, whatever the heck, had, um, had 0.78 pieces of microplastics per cubic meter, right? So obviously this is in a wa this is measuring the water column, which is not typically what we're doing this 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 semester, right? But regardless, it has some measurement. That's everything. That's polyethylene. That's polystyrene. That's fibers. That's microbeads. That's that's just sort of everything together. And so that's super helpful. That's way better than knowing nothing. But we're interested in the, not just the quantity, but the composition of this stuff. And that's really, really going to be helpful for us to predict toxicity, right? Because polystyrene probably has a different impact than polyethylene, which has a different impact than some alkyl. You know, so, 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 so there's all different, there, there's different reasons to do that. A, what might it be doing to the environment? We want to know what this stuff is. B, where did it come from, right? And so knowing more about the composition might help us understand a bit where this material is coming from. If it's mostly, if it's mostly microbeads, right, that's coming from some manufactured chemical process and, and some type of probably waste stream, right? Um, but if it's um, fishing gear uh, and, and, and coming from you know, like let's say um, uh, uh, a nylon rope, right? That could be that could be coming from fishing gear. So, so anyway, so so understanding the composition both will help us predict what the possible ecological consequences might be, and they also will help us Scooby Doo a bit of where this stuff might be coming from. Make sense? Okay. Uh, and so, so that gets us to what we're going to be talking about next. And so, so there's a couple different things here. Uh, as I mentioned before, um, the you know we got our fancy FTIR about three years ago, three 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 maybe four years ago. Um, uh, that was super key for us because again, as we've mentioned, now so going f since for about the last three, four, five years. For you to publish anything in a, in a respectable peer-reviewed journal, to use the term microplastic, you have to have chemically confirmed that that small microscopic item is truly a polymer and not a piece of cotton or a piece of something else. And so that pretty much means for all intents and purposes for the kind of stuff that we're dealing with, either ramen or FTIR. Um, so similar technologies. There, there's a few others where we burn up the material, which we don't really do here. But but basically, you have to use one of these one of these tools. 
But before then, and a lot of this data comes from before then, that wasn't a thing. And, and people, you know, 10 years ago, it was pretty rare for people to be able to get the chemical composition of these substances, right? The big stuff, the, the floating debris, the macroscopic stuff, no, people could do that uh, fairly easily, you know, 10 years ago. And as we mentioned, that technology is in, the, the macroscopic technology, the stuff that we were uh, using for the straw, we are using for the straws and things like that and the, and the beach debris, that should exist at any research, any university does any research in chemistry or that kind of stuff. Um, again, that instrument's more like seven to ten thousand dollars. So that that's that's in the realm of in everybody's chemistry lab that that kind of thing. Um, the 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 FTIR that's the much more specialized. That's the more expensive. That's the harder to get and, and rarer equipment. Um, and so, so what that means is since a lot of these studies were probably done in 2017 and 2014 and 20 whatever the heck, um, they might not have this chemical information. Um, and so in that case, if you go through and look at that reference, um, we need to figure out how we wanna just at least temporarily note that um, no data, right? No data for this. But ideally, we would have data. Now, the, one of the questions is, the ideal thing would be so if this dude over if this dude over here said 0.78 pieces per cubic meter, the ultimate, the best thing we'd love to have is to be able to have that d broken down in a distribution, right? So to say something like uh, 0 0.01 was polyethylene, 0.23 was polystyrene, you know, and kind of have that broken out. I don't. I think virtually nobody will have done that, at least of the historic studies, because they just didn't have the technology and all that kind of stuff. Um, but let, let's take a first stab and see if we can get that. I think what's probably gonna be more common is for them to report the relative abundance of the, if they do any of this, it'll be the relative abundance of this stuff. So they might say that 50% of the sample was polyethylene or polystyrene or something like that. Um, so until we start to go look for, you know, five, six, seven, ten of these references, it'll be a little hard to know. But so this, this ideally would be a concentration, a quantity, but it might be a proportion. And, if, and then in some cases, it might just be presence or absence. And some of the older stuff, they might just say, oh, we identified one of the pieces as polyethylene. And it's like, what the hell does that tell us? That tells us that polyethylene was there in that ocean or in that sediment, but we don't know, right? We don't know much more. Okay, other things that we would like to know are over here. Uh, which are um, the morphology. And so uh, we'll talk about this uh, today. But so this is, um, for these small things, these are just like things come in a diversity of shapes and sizes, but these are some pretty common um, morphologies that we've recognized over the years. And so the vast majority of the stuff that you're gonna encounter is gonna be a fragment or a fiber, a fragment or a fiber. Um, so a fragment is just something that was, so the stuff that you guys were collecting, right? You were collecting mostly macroscopic fragments, right? So the stuff on the beach was part of a, a larger thing, a larger structure. And then because of sun or wind or waves or other, other processes, it started to break down. And so it's now but a small, chunk of the original whole and so that's a fragment and so fragments are massively diverse so there's sometimes some are jagged some are some are oblong some are you know they're all different kinds of shapes and sizes and so that's that's that um uh the other one that's that be very common are the fibers and this is primarily from all of our woven materials right so now as we've talked about i think we talked a little bit about this um it's you know, when I was your age and went to go buy clothes, buy a t-shirt, it was cotton, right? It just was cotton. It was cotton, 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 cotton. And then maybe, maybe if you were, you know, had a, a, a wrestling singlet or something, it was spandex. Or if you were doing yoga or something, you have spandex or something that's plastic. But for the most part, if I just went to random Joe Blow department store and bought a random Joe Blow t-shirt, it would be cotton. Now, 
it's pretty much the reverse. So now if I go into a random store somewhere, almost assuredly it at least has some polymers in there. And indeed, in increasingly it's 100% or, or at least the majority of the woven material is, is, a, is a plastic. And so, um, so that's a problem. Um, and, and that's where most of our fibers are coming from, from our woven materials that are breaking down. So, th so those are the two most common things. We'll talk about the different um, uh, variations of these things. The other thing that we'll do when we do our visual census is we'll do color as well. We'll say what the color of these items are. Um, I think virtually no one will have reported color. So it'd be great if people were reporting color, but, but that's really more uh, to help us with sort of organizing and tracking materials. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I mean, theoretically, we could add color into here as well. And then the last one is size. So mostly how these folks are reporting the, litter, uh, reporting the stuff, which is mostly how we're doing the stuff, is we use some amount of, of sieving, right? Some amount of size sorting. And we say, ah, how many microplastics are between you know, mesh size A and B? And there's 14, okay. And then, and then the amount between size, between filter B and C. And like, okay, so you know, bigger than this, smaller than this, you know, kind of size thing. Um, and that's how most stuff will be reported. Um, uh, where we can, it's, it's good to actually get the actual measurements of the thing, of the item. And so by that, what I mean is the maximum dimension. So a fiber obviously is long, and so that dimension would be the length of that fiber, right? Uh, uh, a, a fragment is gonna have a particular long axis, and so it's gonna be whatever that longest axis is, right? And so, so how we do it is we do the max and then 90 degrees to that max, right? So the fiber it would be, it would be uh, you know, 100 microns and then the width would be like, I don't know, four microns or something like that. Does that make sense? So, uh, so that would be great. And then another, another category that would be great here is controls, some measure of the controls. What did they do for, for uh, uh, um, contamination control, right? And again, now as we move into the future, everybody's doing contamination controls and relatively sophisticated, sophisticated contamination controls. But you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when people were just starting to figure this out, it's not, it, it's unclear what people did, right? And so we don't wanna throw that data out, but we just wanna have that caveat that, you know, did we have, you know, did we have a, a good number? And as a reminder, how, how, we, how we approach these contaminants is we, we always have contaminants, every single thing we do. We work hard to make sure we have minimum contaminants, but, um, but uh, there's gonna be some. And so, so we have sort of our raw data, and then we have the data that we recognize as our, our, our um, adjusted concentrations of these substances, right? And so um, probably most of these references don't do that, um, but that's sort of now the standard state of the art, kind of how to, how to deal with this stuff. So, so it's just important to know, to know that kind of stuff. Does that make sense? Okay, so, that is, so that's our database. And so um, I will um, add this stuff in here um, and, uh, and I'll share this and we'll have this new uh, database. And so, so you guys know the last thing I'll, I'll do is right now, Right now, this sucker is what came out of the what came out of the um, uh, the, the NOAA database, and so I'll add all those other things over here to the right, all of our uh, polymer categories and classes and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, and then uh, this is this is only 37 references, right? We have 266 or something like that in our database now. Now, not all of those will be relevant. Some of them are method paper or something else, right? But, but we'll put them all in. And uh, for the ones that are relevant, those will, those will be at the bottom. And you guys can start adding, 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 we'll be adding to this. Does that make sense? Questions? Okay. So um, before we, uh, 
before we start talking about other stuff, why don't we take a quick uh, a 10 minute break?